I'm, I'm Joe Mark. I'm a senior county manager. I'm Aisha Burnett. I'm also a senior county manager. Jim Muckle, class of 1973, Fordham University. Uh, I, I'm the professor of the advanced accounting class that's here. Uh, Angela, um, accounting transfer. Courtney Cantwell, accounting and senior. Uh, Nathan Sec, uh, accounting senior. Uh, Christian Lenares, accounting senior. Lorenzo Sukunen, accounting junior. Jafer <coughs> Mullowitz, accounting senior. Bless you all for getting into this crazy industry. Mm -hmm. I've spent a lot of years doing uh, accounting. So I draw and you'll have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to read your bio? Or I didn't no, no, I, I was going to actually put it on the screen and yeah. kind of walk through it if you don't mind. Okay. Unless you have any other kind of so. Oh, no, just that we're, well, Mike is also on the President's Council here. So he's one of those alumni that's constantly involved and giving back to the thought, well, you're the co chair of the President's Council, right? So, um, yeah, we're really grateful that he flew in from Florida this morning to be here with all of you. So I, the other, the last thing I want to say was um, I would encourage you to ask questions. I don't know if you want them to wait to the end or if they can raise their hands during. No, uh, this is a discussion. Yeah. You know, this isn't a, you know, a boring presentation. This is a discussion. Stop me at any point in time. As much as I would love to say, you know, I flew in on my corporate personal jet. I did. <laughs> Unless it was stamped with the United next time. So that's what I told them this morning. Okay. And we're going to pass a, a, an attended sheet around, Andrew, if you don't mind, while they're sitting. I just don't want to miss anybody before they leave. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, I will turn that over to you, Mike. We're going to be talking about navigating your career. Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking this time. Um, I had only wished I had somebody come and tell me about how to navigate my career. This was a lot of trial and error. And as we go through this, you'll kind of understand what the trial and error was. But, sorry. So this is my background. I want to take a, a moment to kind of read it. I graduated in 74. Um, I moved here from Montana in 1969. So the end of my junior year in high school, I landed up in Spring Valley. In 1970, it started at Stack. Stack was a really unique place. We had 30 guys and 500 women. So as an accounting major, you figured out all, all those odds, <laughs> right? Then the next year, they brought in 67 more men, and I went into the president's office. I said, this is Marianne Bella, what are you doing to me? She goes, what? I said, they're ruining my odds. <laughs> she politely asked me to leave, and we've been friends ever since. Uh, I was on the first basketball team. We were called the Sparks. And uh, second year, we decided to rename it based upon my pushing to the Spartans. And I told the story about the 300 Spartans. And instead of becoming the Sparks or the Saints, but the Spartans. Um, I got my first job uh, on a tennis court. Um, and what happened was I was working 50 hours a week. I was playing basketball on scholarship. I was dating a girl, and that takes time. Uh, and I went to school. So I had very little time to interview and that. So I was teaching night, uh, adult classes at night for tennis. And I just made an announcement. I said, anybody need a bright young accountant? And uh, one guy came up to me, handed him his business card. And his name was James Ingram. I said, well, you know, I, I have an interview with KPMG, but if that doesn't go, I'll give you a call. He worked for Blue Cross. And they were, at the time, they had an audit team that were auditing hospitals for the Medicare uh, reimbursement program. Hospitals got paid by Medicare to take care of the patients. It was a very complex formula. So didn't get the job at KPMG. Call them up and said, I'd like to interview. Uh, I get up to the 24th floor. I said, hey, where's Jim's office? And they go, who? Oh. I said, yeah, Jim Ingram. Oh, they said, Mr. Ingram's office is in the corner. Now, no, there is no bells going on for me. The only thing I thought was Jim with the knobby knees and the, the plaid top and, and, and striped pants, right? I get there, his secretary graced me, and I said, yeah, I'm here to you know, interview with Jim. She goes, Mr. Ingram, still not registered. 
So she said, wait there and he'll be with you in five minutes. And I get ushered into his office. It's a 20 by 20 foot corner office overlooking lower Manhattan. So in the hierarchy of things, he is the senior vice president of reimbursement. He reports to the CEO, had no clue about that. Remember, there was no LinkedIn, there was no internet. I didn't know who this guy was. Come to find out, he ran and developed the financial reporting and financial finding for Empire Blue Cross. And they stole it and they made it into Medicare. And right now, Medicare is a what? One trillion dollar piece of business. So he started all of this. So by sheer dumb luck, I got a job with the guy who started a whole industry. Um, stayed there for three years, went to work for a accounting firm because I had experience in Medicare cost reporting and understanding that methodology. So I spent seven years there, pretty much 100% billable, which means 2,080 hours, I was charging the claim, which is rare in public account. Usually it's about 17, 1,600 hours that you'll be charging the claim when you first start. The reason I did that is I had that experience in reimbursement and during the off seasons, I could consult with our clients to get them more additional money inside of the Medicare. Um, and that was a big deal. Uh, after that, I went to a hospital, became a controller at two hospitals, and um, I'm a CFO at two other hospitals, went back into consulting, because uh, I found I liked being, trying to figure things out. And it's not that you don't do it when you're running a hospital, but I like to go into various hospitals, you know, finding their parent points, trying to help them get better. The reason I went into accounting to begin with is I had no clue what I was going to do in business. So I figured if I could figure out the debits and credits of any business, I could figure out the business. And sure enough, it's worked for me. Um, I left after consulting, I went back to, I got hired by Deloitte. I got hired by Deloitte because I had this vast experience of running hospitals and auditing consultants. So they put me in their consulting firm. I left there and I went to Cerner. Cerner is one of the second largest electronic medical record companies in the world. Uh, right now they're installing at every, uh, VA hospital in the country, they're installing their electronic medical record. So the way it used to be, hospitals would uh, record it on paper and you'd have you know, medical records this thick or that thick. And to try and find something, you had to go page and, and they were kind of separated, but you still had to go page. This made it into an electronic format. Most hospitals, if not all, have some form of electronic medical record and a patient accounting system. Well, part of my background was I audited and consulted on operations of patient accounting. You know, when you send out a bill and you get cash back, that was part of my expertise. I, I left that and went to uh, Grove and became a regional vice president doing business development. For them. And their two big things was IT outsourcing, and um, patient accounting outsourcing. In other words, taking over IT departments or billing departments. And yes, I did get to meet Mr. Perot. Wonderful man, unbelievable man to work with. I'm not sure they know who. Ross Perot, anybody know Ross Perot? Okay, right then, you got all four of Seriously, make sure you look that guy up. Phenomenal, phenomenal man. Um, but it was a downturn in the economy, and he refused to let anybody go. He said, nobody will get a raise, but I'm not going to let anybody go. And for two years, he didn't let anybody go. The market turned around. Uh, we didn't get raises, but, but that was okay. I had a job. Um, went to an analytics company that did um, analytics for revenue sector. 
So they have whole algorithms and, and where you could drill down and know what patients didn't pay, know what someone's paid, why they paid it, uh, or companies. Remember about 70, I wouldn't say that, maybe 90%, 95% of hospitals' monies come through insurance companies. Very few pay cash, other than deductibles and insurance. Don't sure. And then he went to the GE Healthcare IT. And in there, from any, from um, Cerner all the way up to GE, I did sales and product development. And remember, I'm an account by trip. You ask me today, I'm an account. But that's where I ended up. The other thing I want you to look at. I'm not going to do this well. Yeah, it doesn't move quite. Okay. This will come in important. I got letters behind my name. Not CPA. Anybody know what CPA stands for? You can pass it again. That's, well, that's <laughs> I was kind of say constipated. Yeah, but you can't pass it again. It's even better. Cleaning, pressing, and all. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Cutting, pasting, and assembly. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of things for that. So um, this is what I kind of want to talk about. I mean, you can just stop me anytime you want, but a career versus a job, right? I'm going to take, talk about take time to find your passion. We're going to talk about build your toolbox with tools. I want to talk about bad bosses are good. Good bosses are better. Don't be afraid to fail. Become an entrepreneur. I'll share some stuff with you on that. Evolve, not repeat. And where you start may not be where you finish. Okay? And again, stop me where you want. Now, I didn't really know what I wanted to be. I didn't know where I wanted to be other than I needed a job. So I became a captain. And it was a good job, paid well, but I never felt comfortable that's where I was going to end up my life. Um, checked in to be an FBI agent because they needed accountants, checked in to become a treasury. And for some crazy reason, probably after a night on the uh, town, I decided to uh, go to be a rear electronics officer for an F 14 until the Navy told me I was too tall. And sure, they take me, but they didn't think they could eject me out of it without losing my legs. So that's probably not where I want to be. <laughs> so it took me until I was about 27. I, I, I kind of figure out what I wanted to do. And it really happened this way. It was, I was helping a hospital during the day. And the guy had to file this 130-page cost report. Didn't know anything about it. This was kind of clueless. So I said, look, I'm not supposed to do this, but I'll come tonight. I walked him through the whole thing, showed him where to get all this stuff. Everything else. He did it over a week and he filed it on time. Otherwise the penalty would have been severe. Um, and at that point I realized I like working for healthcare because even though some of the companies I worked for were for profit, I liked working for them because I was helping people help people. They can't run a hospital without cash. Cash comes in, billing, collecting. Simple as that. And then back in the day, it was this 130-page report. If you did it correctly, you would get money. And you would get a lot of money. If you did it incorrectly, you had a chance of losing millions. And then you'd have to hire a consultant, come in and try and figure it out. And um, I have a number of hospitals that I brought in two, three, four, ten million dollars from. And that many times was a case between living and dying and closing. So I felt really good about that. I found my passion for that. If you're going to do anything, find your passion.
Yeah. Filling a toolbox with tools. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, people are going to hire you right out of college for what's on your resume. People after that are going to hire you and pay you more money based upon the tools you've got. So, for example, I went to Empire Blue Cross because I didn't have anything else. However, I learned a Medicare cost report that every hospital in the United States had to file. I learned it intimately because you had to do it manually. It's none of these computer stuff. I would go to any hospital. Anybody know the definition of an auditor? Anybody? Auditors are the guys that go in after the battle and then at the wounded. Right? They come in and they tell everybody what's wrong with the account after people were in the wars trying to do the monthly books back and forth. Back and forth. So um, being an auditor allowed me to go anywhere in the hospital, ask any questions. And then after I'm part of Blue Cross, it became a financial auditor. Then I can go anywhere, right? All the way up to the board. And it was a great experience because you learn something every day. So if you get a chance of being an auditor, do it, whether it's internal, external, financial, Deloitte, anybody. It's a great, great experience. But it gives you tools. Now I went through my kind of resume and I talked about the companies that I worked for. Well, I'm not a sales guy back then until I realized in public accounting, if you wanted to become a partner, you had to sell the business. And it wasn't just like, hey, I can give you 25 cents less on the audit. It was, you had to become a trusted advisor. Most CEOs, most CFOs, they have four or five people they trust and they will call and ask questions about it. Very difficult for a CEO to come down, you know, and said, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. Think you can help me out? Can't do that. Can't do that with a CFO. So, um, as you look, as I go through my career in that, I went to every job with what tools am I going to get here? And will those tools, well, where will they take me next? And so it was never on a, a singular path of this way. It was in a path like this. I could go here, I could go here, I could go here, I could go here. So think about that when you get your jobs. Now, I had one gentleman that I interviewed right out of school, broken kid, I didn't hire him. The reason I didn't hire him, you know, he had a B plus. We got in the interview and we're talking. I said, well, I see here that, you know, you do watercolor, tell me how, tell me how it works. How, does, how, does, how, does, how do you, you know, mix the colors and what you do? He was like, well, it just mixed the colors. Of the book. He goes, you know, this is the stupidest interview I've ever had. I said, well, okay, let me stop. I'm not going to be the interview. I'm not going to be the interview. Let me explain something. I see you got an accounting degree. I see you got good grades. I know you know a debit from the credit, even if I turn you around in your seat. What I don't know is can you talk to people? We're auditors. We have to ask leading questions. We have to understand what they're saying and apply it back to the balance sheet. And he goes, well, well. I, I, nobody ever told me that. So well, I'm telling you that now. I said, by the way, the interview's over. Thanks. Good luck. Right? Now, the other thing is, I interviewed a gentleman who um, downturned in the economy. He got laid off from Orange and Rockland after 23 years. He was their controller. But he had read somewhere that public, that uh, healthcare was a growing field and they were going to expand. He said, well, he came through a friend and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to him about it. And as we're going back and forth, I said, well, what associations did you ever belong to? None. I said, what did you do for 23 years? He said, monthly, I produced the financial statements. And I knew everything about Orange and Rockland financial statements. He said, so how are you going to help me? He said, well, I can do financial statements. Have you ever done a hospital financial statement? No. So we're in consulting, 
I have to sell work. I wake up every morning unemployed until somebody hires me. And I have to go out and drum up business. So how are you going to help? So the only tools he had for Orange and Rock. So he can only go to the utilities. Now, did you notice my back of my name? It said FHFMA. Okay, I belong to the Healthcare Financial Management Association. That's where everybody in healthcare finance goes. That's our industry organization. And if you looked, I was the president of the New Jersey chapter because I got involved. And then, somebody challenged me to become a fellow. A fellow means I've worked in the industry for X amount of years. I've taken a um, two-day test all about healthcare. And they give you this fellow. Guess what? I passed. Surprising as heck. But I passed it. So that's why I have that. But I'm heavily invested in healthcare financial management associates. Why? I got a lot of jobs out of there, you know, consulting jobs. Um, all of the CFOs belong to it. So I became friends with all of them. Some of them became CEOs. I don't know how, but they did. Okay. So, so get involved, whether it's, you know, if you go work for Boeing, find the financial Boeing people and go do it. And just don't go within that company unless you want to make a career in it. Go to the outside organizations. You learn so much more. I've probably been in, I would say, close to 800 to 1,000 hospitals. You've seen one hospital, you've seen one hospital. They all do two things differently. You know, cash is cash, but they all run their operations differently. They all have different cultures. Right? But it's good to do that. So, um, you know, take a look at that. Look at plan your career as to where you want to go. Yeah. What would define the word tools in your in a sentence or two? I would say a tool is you're the partner. I'm the um, staff captain. I've got to go on a, a client meeting. Would you like to come? The answer is always absolutely. Because you can, I can watch him interact with the client. Right? And you'll just pick up how he interacts. What does he say to them? I had a partner show up after a three martini lunch to one hospital. He spent an hour looking at the financial statements. He went into the CEO and did an hour presentation. He invited me in. And I'm like, I, I just spent a month auditing these things. You looked at it for an hour. He then goes to the board meeting, spends another different presentation to the board, at a much higher level. And afterwards, we went to dinner. I said, Marty, how did you do that? He goes, after 20 years, you think I know what I'm doing. But he was able to understand the financial statement, read the notes, asked 10 questions that were important, I was able to give two brilliant presentations. Now, from my side, I'm sitting here telling you 40 years later, what a brilliant guy that man was. And he was, but it made an impression on me and he let me be there. That's a tool, right? That's a tool. So um, learning how to audit, that's a tool. Um, preparing financial things, those invaluable preparing. Um, putting the notes, financial statements, right? Going in and talking and being the ability to interact and ask leading questions. Very, very, very critical. Good bosses are a good thing, but um, bad bosses are a good thing, good bosses are better. And what I mean by that is you're going to run into a bad boss, right? Now, just remember, when you're interviewing, you're the interviewee. You also should be the interviewer because you're going to ask yourself a question. Do I want to be here? Is this the culture I want to be in? Is this leader going to give me tools, an opportunity to move and advance? One of my first interviews I had with Bechtel Power Corporation out in California. And the guy asked me, where do you want to be in five years? I looked him straight in the eye and said, I want to be in your job. I said, my job when I started is to make your, you look good. 
If you look good and you move up, I get to move up because I made you look good. Simple as that. Um, so a bad boss is a bad boss. You're never going to get around. But learn from it. Learn what not to do. You know, they'll abuse people. They'll, they'll you know, backstab. They'll do all of this. They'll, you know, you're a nice guy and then behind your back, they'll live. Get out when you can. But learn what not to do. And that's probably been as much as important for me to learn and go through it and go through the pain as a good boss. And I've had some great bosses. I've had some great bosses. And I've had some great companies to work for. And the ones I like to work for are the ones that work as a team. How many played sports? Right? You all know working what a team is. You all know what the goal is. I don't care where you're going to work unless you have your own business. And that's all you're doing. You're going to have to have some kind of team, some esprit de corps, some reason to do it. And getting in that is going to be so much better. There are people from my public accounting days I still see. They still hang out. There's people from my Cerner days. I just, just came back from Florida playing golf with a very good friend who's my boss. But we got together and we had, a, we had an unbelievably strong team of very talented people. And those are what you want to find. And you, you'll probably end up stumbling on this. Don't be afraid to fail, because you're going to do it. You are going to fail. It's how you react to that thing that you learn from it. I was let go. I was fired after 40 years. That was a hard nut to swallow. I got, I got fired on the phone on a Thursday night. I was told my last day will be the next. So I had, had somebody sat to a seminar and they said, never fire somebody on a Saturday, Friday. Always fire them on a Monday or Tuesday. And somebody raises their hand and said, why? Because, because this is what you tell them. You tell them whatever the reason they got fired and then tell them your new job is to find a new job. So have your pity party tonight. Tomorrow, wake up in the morning Write down all of your contacts, right? Write down the reason you got let go. The reason I got let go is they were being bought out and they needed to downside senior knowledge. And everybody understands that. Now, it certainly beats, well, I hit the CEO with a golf club because he was an idiot, right? I didn't do that, but you want to make your story and stick with it and consistent, right? I'm going to give you or to this organization, two books, they're the same. And it was by the guy who got fired with me. He was Pullman. And the name of this book is Above the Chatter, Our Words Matter. And he's a words, loves words. And he spent, he spent, I guess, 400 days trying to get a job. But every day he wrote a new word down, an empowering word, a strength word, right? So he could do it. Now, on the other hand, I started Big Sky Management. And I went out and did free consulting for 15 months. And I got into some really interesting things. I got into iPads for patients at hospitals that had all of their information about their diseases. You know, what, what's the approved um, websites? And then uh, the documentation that they could use. We put it into a bone marrow transplant. And they have to be in there for 30 days. So they get pretty bored. But they had this iPad. And we were state of the art. Nobody else had this. Now there's a bunch of people that do it. But we did that. I did it for free. Why? Kept me in the game. Kept me available to say, what are you doing? Hey, I'm doing this. I would go to the Healthcare Financial Management Association meetings. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, I got my own consulting firm. So it made action. So when you fail, one, learn from it. And two, make sure that you go forward. Don't wallow in it, but learn from it. Storms will come. When you're in any organization, it will hit the fan. It's how you react to them. 
the people who take a step back, evaluate the situation, figure out what's going on, and don't and come up with more than one solution. I'm going to tell you in life, there's never one solution. There's a lot of them. Some of them are quick fixes, and everybody tries to do that quick fix, and it will eventually come back and bite you. Take that moment back, think about it. What's the reason that happened? How do we go about fixing it? What's the best solution or two or three? And then bring it, bring it to your, your organization. They, that's, that's what they're paying for. They're paying for you to come up and help them through the estate. There's never been a company that hasn't helped them. Sure who it is. This is my favorite slide. Is the class half full or half empty? Well, an optimist sees it half full. Pessimist sees it half empty. An entrepreneur sees the class has water in it. And can think over 2,000 things water can give. This was the best ad I ever saw. It was done by 3M. I called them numerous times saying, can I get this ad? So I had to recreate this ad. This, is, this is really isn't their ad, but I had to recreate it. Anybody know anything about 3M? They um, They're a chemical company. Yeah, that is. Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. Mm -hmm. That's and um, has anybody ever seen the old TV show? I think it was eight episodes called In Search of Excellence. Oh my gosh, yes. I know. I read the book too, right after I saw the show. I'm a visual learner, not a, not a book learner, but find it somewhere. I know it's the it was, MSNBC. It's, it was a PBS special. Okay. They did it originally. Okay. And then I'm sure it's been on MSNBC. Because, because the company I was controller of, they came to us and I'm actually, my picture is in the credits. Oh, yeah? My picture, not my name. But, okay. Yeah, but I remember that show. So 3M believes in entrepreneurship. They want their people to spend, I think it's five or 10% of their time approved on coming up with good ideas. Anybody ever see post-it notes? Do you know the story of post-it notes? Oh, no, no, anybody? I, yeah, I heard it. Okay. Post-it notes was a failure, a $300 million failure. By the way, on the entrepreneurship, if you get a product to market, you get 1% of the net sales. Three hundred million. Probably cost them 50 million. You have 1% of 250 million every year. So what happened was they were trying to make um, crazy glue, a really hard, sticky glue. And it just wasn't working. It, whatever they put it on, it would fall off. It wouldn't stick, it wouldn't stick. And stick. So one guy was in a, um, he was in a choir and he would be putting, you know, it would change every week and he'd put this in. And this would be in here and all of that. But they kept falling out. So he had this sticky glue that just wouldn't stick. He put it on the back of it. He could stick it on this page, right the, you know, where it was. And the next week, he'd take it out, put it there again. So they all looked at him and said, hey, that's pretty good. And everybody in the church goes, hey, I want some of this. So what they did is they got manufacturing, developed, you know, little pads of sticky notes. And they would hand it out. And, and uh, they brought it to marketing work and said, oh, this is stupid. Nobody's going to use this. So they, what they did is they would write notes on inner office mail. They would write it on the sticky note, put it on the piece of paper, and shut that out. Because we didn't have an email back then. We had inner office mail with envelopes, right? So we get in, they go, hey, where'd you get this? And they go, hey, call our secretary. So they called the secretary and said, oh, I got one. And 
she'd pass them out and it would be go all the way through 3 a.m. And everybody's like, where'd you get this? Where'd you get this? Nine o'clock on Monday, they stopped handing them out. But what they did say is call marketing. At 10.30, they were in marketing, pitching their idea because marketing got a thousand calls on what's this stupid thing? Do the paper on this? I don't know. Well, there's this group over here. Well, I don't know. And they finally had a call. So they said, how to bring it up through the ranks. There's a, there's a whole process in there to bring it up through the ranks. And if you get it up there, then you have to help in the market. So they all decided that the best way to market was the CEO's administrative assistant would take a container of post-it notes and send it to every Fortune 500 company administrative assistant. And she would get it with a note that says, hey, we just came out with this. Thought you might find this of interest. And this is how we used it. So the CEO would, Madman would write notes and stick it to the CEO. CEO goes, hey, these are great. Where'd you get them? She goes, well, here, three of them sent Here, take one. He'd write it to all his SVPs. And the SVPs would go, where'd you get this? Oh, right, from my secretary. So she'd hand them out. And then he would go to the VPs. The VPs would go, where'd you get it? And then she goes, I only have three left. I don't know. Call purchase. They created a need. Right? That's what 3M does. When you're in your, whatever you are, look for those possibilities that you can bring value to your organization. Because that's what they're paying you for too, is the value and your experience. I would show this slide to, um, I would show this slide to a lot of my computer clients when I sold them electronic medical records. Many of their systems, the patient caring systems, many of their systems were 20, 30 years old. And what is the hardest thing for people to do? Anybody? Change. Change. So, I would put this up and say, when we put in your new system, you're going to tell me this is the way we've always done it. And I'm going to tell you, you've been driving a VW bug. And I'm selling you a Ferrari. And what you're going to ask me to do is pull that V12 Ferrari engine, highly tuned, take it at 230 miles an hour. And you want me to take that out and put a VW bug engine and then complain to me why I can't go 230 miles an hour. We built a new system so it can go and do all the things and faster and better and all of that. So why do you want to keep doing the way you did it? You're going to have to learn. And I would show this all the time. Now, the reason that's here is evolve versus repeat. At Deloitte, they used to have a mantra. Reinvent yourself every five years. No matter what you think your expertise is, work to change it, to strengthen it, to advance it. So I don't want you to change. I want you to evolve. That's a better, stronger word, isn't it? Our words matter. I want to strengthen your processes. I don't want to change them and strengthen them. Don't we all want to be strong? So again, when we talk about you know, this kind of thing, think to yourself, where I'm going to be in five years. I was asked recently, what was the greatest invention in my lifetime? And it took me a while. But that's my family asked me. It took me a while. And I said this, right? The finger. To me, this is the greatest invention. In my business career, once I had this, didn't matter where I was, anywhere in the world, right? I could be in contact with people. I could email. They all don't think that much of it, but we didn't have internet. We had it in office. And in fact, I used to be mad when Federal Express came in. 
because I wouldn't be doing a letter that I should have done because I procrastinated. But I know I had two or three days because it would be coming through the mail. And I was, oh, I just put it in the mail. You know how slow the mail is. Federal Express came in and you get it overnight. So that means I had to do it. And then all of a sudden, fax machines. Oh, I wanted it in 10 minutes. But that was horrible. And then we got an email. Well, just email it to me. It means I had to do it pretty quick and get it out, right? But no matter where I'm in, I can look at anything and get an answer, get more than one answer, figure stuff out, anyone will. Which to me is phenomenal. phenomenal. Where you start may not be where you end up in your journey. So I talked about where I went and everything I did and how I got there. And you may start out as an accountant, but God only knows where we're going to end up. Hand, it's your tools. Look at that hand. Which, which avenue am I going to go to? And there's been a couple of times I've had to take a step back. It wasn't the right path that I wanted to go on. It wasn't, I had a bad boss. This was not where I wanted to be. But I started out as an accountant, ran operations for hospitals, got back into software and development, and I loved them both. I absolutely loved them both because I took the view of the entrepreneur and said, how can I make my colleagues in hospitals smarter? How can we do it quicker? How can we do it cheaper? And get provide it for people who really need it. Somebody asked me recently, I went in to visit a friend in the hospital and they asked me, you know, like hospitals. I said, I love hospitals. This is all like visiting sick people. That's what the hospitals have. But I'll tell you, the problem with healthcare in America right now is, is, um, is make me better. Let me abuse my body. Let me do all these bad things. But when I get in the hospital, you got to make me better, right? So when you have people have with diabetes and all of that sort of stuff, some of that stuff could be prevented. Colon cancer. You got an early uh, colonoscopy, 90, 95% cure rate. So that's my story. I've got a take home for you. I've got one. Take home. I'm going to leave these here. Through our careers, both Bruce and I, we've always believed that words matter. Use strong words, not weak words. So I talked about strengthening versus change. Right? I don't say, you know, your, your internal controls are bad. I always say, we're going to strengthen them. Everybody wants to be stronger. Nobody wants to say, those really were bad. And, you know, you didn't know what you were doing. Right? There's a way to I'll call it sugarcoat it or, or make them buy into it by doing that. So I just heard Bruce's talk and he goes through his story and he talks about this. I would ask you to spend that 27 minutes. I think it's 27 minutes. Just watch it, listen to it. Okay. He's got a great story, but really he is such a positive person on everything he tries to do. And he brings a lot of positivity to his company. And one of the things in search of excellence was, one of the things they found out is the culture is based upon two or three people that drive it. Can't have seven people driving culture, you have two or three people. And wherever he goes, he tries to be one of those three people. It's not the CEO, he's not the CFO, but he's one of their leading salesmen. And they give him the opportunity to go around to all their sales and all their clients and either tell his story or just be there. And he's such a powerful, positive person. You gotta love him, especially once you hear a story. So that's your takeaway. And with that, I'm, I'm done. Any, anything you wanna talk about? One question. Did you have a CPA? No, I did not. Why did you choose not to? They, they chose it for me. Oh. <laughs> I took it about eight times. Okay. Four of those times was in May. 
So my public accounting experience in healthcare, our busy time was January 15th to May 1st. And May 3rd is 4th, 5th, 6th when the exam is, right? Seven, it was when I was there. I used to work 700 hours of overtime in that period. I've done 79 days straight of 14 hour days. So essentially I had four times to take it. Um, I'm not gonna share my transcript, but I'm not, the, uh, I'm not a book lender, okay? So, so I, I passed different parts, but I never could practice, do pra uh, practice. Back then it was a two part practice. And the reason I struggled with it is I did healthcare. You get one question in healthcare, maybe once, twice. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I, I couldn't spell earnings per share, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So it was much, much harder for me. But I did it, did I want it? Yes. But I didn't get it. I ended up going running hospitals. And so when that's just another tool in my toolbox is I know the politics in the hospital. I know the three most important people in the hospital. I know the politics on the board. I know the internal politics within the senior leadership, right? So I bring something much different. While I was a CFO, I ended up building on, on with a small group of people. We built our own billing and collection, scheduling and registration and medical record system. Yeah, that was painful too. <laughs> but again, those are some of the things that, that, that we did. But that, that's why I didn't do it. If you can get it, get it. People like to see that credential behind your name. And I've, I've got CPAs that are running hospitals. So it doesn't, doesn't roll you into that, that model. Right. But yeah, that's a great thing to have. I just didn't. I was gonna make a comment and just because these students are gonna be graduating. So you mentioned at the beginning about at the tennis court, making that announcement, does anybody need a great accountant? And I guess I wanted to partially emphasize how, you know, if you guys graduate, you might be at a graduation party and someone may say, hey, what do you think you want to do? You should engage the conversation. If you let people know what you're looking for, they will be in many cases inclined to try to help in some way. And that's exactly how he got that opportunity just by making that statement. So networking plays such a major piece in, you know, 70 to 80% of job leads is what they say, you know, are from networking. So I would encourage you, and I guess you sprinkled through some other things about networking, joining professional associations. And I would, I don't know if there's any other. Well, yeah, it was funny on the way from the airport with my wife, she got, I told her what I was talking about. She goes, mention mentoring. I said, okay. And mentoring is find somebody who can mentor you. And it may not be one person. It may be more than one person. You mentor somebody else as well. If somebody's taking the time and believe in you, then you better take the time and believe in them and give back. Right? You will get more out of that giving back than you ever got by, by being mentored. You'd be surprised. So. That's an important find whether it's the godfather, godmother, a mentor, whatever you want to call them, right? Find that person, and and it may not be one. And I I have I have a few people that I that's mentored me. One of them is not even in business, not even in healthcare, but he's in HR. And boy, he saved me a a couple of times on on. on um, you know, HR issues. But you don't have to just have one. And it could be a peer, you know, you could come into each other. Like, you're not going to believe what this person did. But what do you think? Or, you know, use your peers. They're good mentors. Right? In public accounting, when the, when the promotions came out, um, and there was only so many, it's a pyramid. It only goes so high and it's up around. But when the promotions came out, I'd be the first one on the phone call of my peers to wish them good luck. There were other people who never talked to them again. They got promoted over me. 
my attitude was, if he gets promoted, right, then next year I'm going to get promoted. And I'm going to help him. Even though we were peers, he's now my boss. Doesn't matter to me. Because my job is to make you look good. So I look good. Um, you mentioned uh, your experience um, interviewing uh, previously, and um, can you tell me about an, ex an interviewing experience you had with someone that you were most impressed with? Um, yeah, they, they had the same background I had. She was working a lot of hours. She, she played sports. She had a way better GPA than I did. She was brilliant. And she was very driven, but um, she played college soccer. So, you know, I put it all together. She was very articulate. Um, and it wasn't just about, you know, degree. I knew she could, she was the type of person that would ask me questions I had asked her. So it wasn't really an interview, it was a conversation. And I, her brilliance just came through on the way she answered it, the way she you know, formed her her words and those kind of things. But, but yeah, she impressed me a lot. And, and when we came back, I said, we're, we're hiring her. Comes to find out it was a sister of a guy who worked there. I didn't, I didn't make the connection, but I said, yeah, she, she, uh, I said, she's our people. This is the type of person when we go out, we want. Unfortunately, we kept her in healthcare and she can do anything else. That's another story. You know, when you get into firms, and, and back in the day, you used to kind of silo you. So my firm was um, healthcare, hospital, hotels, um, country clubs, co-ops, and real estate. That's what primarily we had. So they were just, you came in, and said your healthcare, and ended up having spending your career there. Not that people didn't go other way. But I would say now you've got so many tools. You've got the internet to look up the company. You've got was a glass store to look up what they're saying about the employees and employer. You've got LinkedIn. So you're going to know somebody's uh, background in that. How many of you looked me up on the LinkedIn? <laughs> okay, that's one bad check mark for you. Got to do that. You've got to learn um, for, for a meeting. You've got to learn to look at people's backgrounds. You'll be much more um, informed. You'll be able to talk to them better. Uh, and again, it may be, oh, gee, I see that uh, you were in the Bermuda to uh, the Newport sailing race. How is that? It's something to be out of the Let me give you a clue. People like to talk about themselves a lot. So God gave us two ears, one mouth. Listen more than talk and ask that open question. Nine times out of 10, if they're talking 95% of the time and you're talking 95% of the time, they're going to walk out of here saying, what a great person. They're very interesting. They, you know, they had some really interesting things to say. And yet, you only had 5% five, five of the conversation. How many students here have LinkedIn profile? Does everybody have? Okay. And if you don't, definitely <laughs> should be getting LinkedIn profiles. Some recruiters are willing to get dates out if they don't have a LinkedIn profile. So it is a big deal. Many have resumes. I mean, who doesn't have a resume? The other thing is scrub your social media. Uh, People are looking at it. So when my son, uh, my son is a major in the Army right now. He's up at the Naval War College. But when he went to Loyola, ROTC, the first thing they do is they raise your hand, you get inducted into the Army. So he, had a, he was on a four-year scholarship, but he did induct in the Army. Second thing they said is, you have three days to scrub your social media. Anything inappropriate, anything, anything in there. And from now on, if we find that, you're subject to the code of military justice, we will prosecute you and you'll be doing hard time in Leavenworth, Kansas. That's where the prison is, the military prison. So 
never did anything wrong after that. Not that he did before, because he told me he never did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but but even in college, he would not have people take pictures of him or anything and don't post to his media. But people do look at that. And as you're seeing in a, in a lot of the stuff comes up, somebody posted something 10 years ago, and now it's coming back to haunt them. So again, be very, very careful. Very careful. What do you think when you hear accountant? <laughs> so when I became the hospital CFO, I got a raise, which was nice. But I told my wife that I serve at the pleasure of the board and the CEO. I could get fired next week. So don't get don't get you know happy that I got this raise. And she said, Well, how come? You work for both. He said, I have a fiduciary responsibility to protect the assets of the organization. If I don't pay the biweekly federal and state taxes, I can be personally sued and my house can be attached. I have a fiduciary responsibility that protect every dollar that comes in and out of that organization. You don't know what fiduciary is, go look that up. So when you hear accountant, you better think honest, ethical. Because there's a lot of accountants still sitting in jail. I had a guy who worked for Health, I'll call it Health South, but I think that's what it means. He had built a 14 bedroom, but each one had an ensuite bath. Huge house with the CFO. His backyard was a Georgia Bulldog football field, big Georgia field. Um, when he gave the presentation, he showed his what he did for a living at this point, after he did three years for fraud of cooking the books. And uh, he was cutting lawns at 67 with a John Deere tractor. So when I think accountant, I think honest, ethical people. So hopefully you do too. Because you will, there's there's big opportunity for somebody to get in trouble and then they'll drag you down and you don't want that. Walk away. Walk away. You always find another job as a count. You don't want to find the job in a being the accountant in the jail. So not that you are, not that you are, you know, thinking about that, but that's what an accountant's about. At the end of the day, when I say I'm an accountant by trade, that's what it means. What else? We got time. Oh, too, too late? Mm -hmm. yeah, oh, I'm that. sorry, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Flood. Good. Well, here's my business cards. Now, don't laugh at the email address because my kids do too. But you certainly can email me either through LinkedIn or here and ask me questions, whatever. It's all. Now, the reason why it's big sky is for Montana. Yeah. Second reason is I had five minutes to figure out the name of the company. So that's, <laughs> that's as imaginative as I could come. <laughs> Anything else? Any questions? Mike, I was um, going to ask you about, so you were talking about good bosses, bad bosses. I'm curious in your experience over the years, what, what 
experience you've had with, with like what made someone a good boss? What was something that you took away and what was maybe something you experienced that you would not want to be in the boss? Well, I would say working for PKF, I worked for the first female partner in the firm and she was a pain in my backside. She wanted me to dot the I's and cross the T's. She had a thousand post-it notes on all my work papers. And I loved it for her because she made me better. Of course, after she did that, we'd go all out to dinner and just have a fun time. We were all young and crazy, right? But she was great. Later on, I had another woman boss and, and we just worked as a team. It was... Boom, boom, boom. We, there. I could do anything I wanted. I, I could do anything I wanted. I mean, we knew what we wanted to do. We had a lot of freedom, and we touched base maybe once a week. And you know, she was doing her stuff on this level. I was doing my stuff on that level. And there was just trust. And she appreciated the tools I had, and I appreciated the tools she had. Um, the guy I just played golf with. Uh, he was in the military. Um, did some pretty dangerous, crazy stuff. But he was another guy that, that was very strategic because he had to be, that's what he grew up on. He had to be strategic. So he would do a lot of LinkedIn. He would look at the backgrounds of the hospital. He would do all this research and make you do that. And then you had to present to him about, you know, what was going on, what's your strategy, how are we gonna attack this? You know, I'll go to, he's gonna go talk to the CEO because he was a former, Hospital Chief Operating Officer, I was the CFO, I go to the CFO. So we divided and conquered. And then he had a team of very, very talented revenue cycle people. So um, in the, during the day, we would go out and sell. At night, my charge was to develop a reporting system for the patient accounting system. So I would be get done with dinner and so seven to 10, we'd work on reporting. There were other folks that were working on you know, strengthening the scheduling system or the implementation of it. But we all got together on a Friday and thank God HR wasn't listening to the call. But you just were like sharing things. We talked to people. Uh, I just went to a lady's father who passed away his funeral that I haven't worked with since 2007, but she's a dear, dear friend just from that experience. So, you know, I would say that, that just the love of, camaraderie and working together to spread the That's that's what helps. Oh, I'm sorry, I just have one more question. You sure. said you work for PKF? Yeah. PKF O'Connor? Yeah. Oh, I actually applied there. Did you? Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. I'm actually in the middle of the uh, interview stage with them. And uh, what was like location? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um was uh that location that you talking about in Harrison right No, oh, no, ours was in uh, 420 Lexington in downtown. But let's take it offline. Maybe I know some folks. Um, my interviewer right, uh, that I spoke with was Ashley Quink. No, I don't know Quink. No. My, most of my partners are either retired or close to it. So. But I could give you a couple of names. Um, that's the, yeah, I'm sorry, that's the only name that uh, no. I, I've been talking to so far. Well, we'll, we'll connect. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Uh, bad bosses, I had one guy who uh, hired me, wanted me desperately, and then treated me like uh, I was the stupidest guy in the room, even though I was smarter than him. He couldn't stand somebody smarter than him. And so he just made my life miserable. And I only lasted a year there. But I got to Cerner and totally changed my path. So I learned from him. I don't have to be the smartest people in the world. Mm -hmm. But I knew that a long time ago. I just got to surround myself with lots more people. Can you talk about fiduciary? Um, funny, because I was talking to Professor Muckle that, about possibly going into fiduciary accounting. Do you meet many fiduciary accountants or? No. Um, were we talking about fiduciary or were we talking about forensic? Forensic. I do. Levels. Yeah, forensics. Um, um, I think that's a great field to be in. 
-hmm. I have a good friend who kind of took his career uh, into forensic accounting. He ended up working for uh, Deloitte and then a smaller firm and then somebody else, but yeah. And he posts on, on Instagram and Facebook that it was last year he did 235 days of playing golf. So he's not hurting him. <laughs> and a great, great guy and a great, but that's a great, great field to be in. Yeah, that, that's a great field. You're obviously, from what you said before, a pretty big fan of H. Ross Perot. And uh, what, what is your, what, what did, what's the most impressive thing that you learned working for a man who they obviously don't know who he was, but he was a serious presidential candidate. Losing track of the year, was that 2000? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So Ross Perot uh, was a presidential candidate, but he started as a son of a poor coal dealer. And he would ride his bike in the snowstorms out in the Midwest, delivering a thousand papers because he wanted money. There's a, if you work for him, you had to read his book. And it's a great, great book. So if you find a book on Ross Perot, get it. I would say when you went there, um, his office building uh, was um, huge, but he had all this memorabilia in there. He supported the military like nobody else. He actually was a, a the Navy, Naval Grand, and um, went five years in the Navy, and then went out to business. Um, but it was a shrine to all of the stuff. Or as his wife would say, get this stuff out of my house. I don't want it in my house anymore. Find a place for it. Um, but you would walk through and you'd see, you know, the SEAL Team 6 gave an award, or, or this, this military unit, or that military unit. And it's amazing. You'd walk through and there would be this huge parachute. <laughs> And he bought all of the Russian space um, agency stuff that they were going to throw out. He said, no, 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 I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it. And the reason I'm keeping it is because it made us, the United States, better because we were against the Russians trying to get into space. So he spent a lot of money. He bought the Magna Carta, the only Magna Carta in private hands. He bought it for $7 million. And the lawyer that went and got it, put it in a leather case, walked it onto the plane, walked it off the plane, and delivered it to Ross. Royal, uh, royal family was very, very angry that that got out of England, the Magna Carta. So he sold it back to him for $35 million. That's Ross Perot. Okay. I, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it through this, but he had all of this memorabilia. But one of the things that really, really chokes me up every time I tell it is in this little glass case is a blue tin cup. And it was presented to him by a colonel who spent 10 years in Hanoi Hilton. So if you know what Hanoi Hilton, that was the prison where all the downed pilots were taken and tortured daily. McLean is there. Yeah. Uh, uh, Senator McCain. Uh, McCain. McCain. Um, but um, you had, you know, he was the guy who they fed, dressed up, and he was going to meet um, Jane, Fonda? Jane Fonda back in the day. And he slipped her a note. And she slipped it back to the North Korean or North Vietnamese. Yeah. She was for the North Koreans or for Vietnam. He got tortured out. So people of our age are a fan of Jane. Mm -hmm. um, but Ross said, look at, we got to get these people out. And the government was not really doing what he thought. He hired a Braniff 727 put all the, a lot of the families, wives, and kids in the plane and flew them to North Vietnam. He was gonna land there and try and force his way in. Ross is about this big, and he would bulldoze anybody. Size did not matter, it was between his ears. So Ross um, 
tries to land, wouldn't let him in. Spent three days in Thailand trying to get in. And they were going through peace talks in Paris. Put the plane over in Paris and paraded all these families in Pierre's peace talks. Within three months, they were released. So he had a lot to do with releasing these prisoners. But there's this blue cup. And the lady who, who tells the story says when this colonel, Matt Ross, he gave him his most, his, he had three prized possessions, a picture of his family, his Bible, and this cup. This cup is what he ate with, got watering, got his nourishment from. That was his prized possession. He loses the cup. He's going to have to eat out of his hands a lot. That was his prize. He gave it to Ross. He said, the moment you paraded people in to that, to that um, meeting, our lives got so much better. And I didn't realize it until afterwards. So I wanted to give you my most prized possession. That's Ross Perot. I would go the ends of the earth for that one. And I've only met him twice. Once at 1.30 when he was getting his ice cream. Did you ever hear, what's it, On Wings of Eagles? It's a book about when the, uh, the Iranians took the 54 members of our um, um, staff in, in Iran. In the embassy. In the embassy and held them hostage. There were six, I think three to six, of Ross's employees, EDS, trying to pay the systems that the Iranian people hid out and they had to keep moving. And Ross said, we're gonna go get them. Ross wanted to hop in a car and drive again. They said, no, 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 no. So we hired Bull Simonson, Colonel who did special ops, to come up with that. And they actually were able to drive in undercover, dressed as Iranians, and they were able to get um, the six out because uh, they were given Canadian passports, and they got, they made it home. Were those the the ones that were the subject of the movie Argo? Um, no, that, I don't think so. That was a group of yeah. people that that know. was another group. I don't think it was it wasn't that. Yeah. But there is a movie called I think on, on, on of okay. I think that's what it was. But think about that. You're in trouble. The American government can't get you out. They had a failed attempt to rescue 54 hostages. And Ross figures out a way. I'd like to work for a guy like that. If you're in trouble. So in the first Gulf War, one of the guys that I worked with, he was a captain and he got re-upped to go back in. And Ross meets him and said, listen, just tell your wife, there might be some men coming around the house, don't worry about it. He said, your yard, everything will be taken care of. Here's a phone number. This is my chief of staff. If your wife needs anything, call that number. If there's a security issue, call that number. And he kept his salary for the like six or eight months that he was away. Full salary. Didn't have to, that's what he did. That's a good boss. Yeah. Bad bosses? That's okay. But you'll figure that out. You know, go to as many interviews as you can. Talk to as many people. How did they get their job? You know, just remember, you're interviewing them. They're, in, they're interviewing you. You're interviewing them. Is this a place I want to work? Does it have a good culture? What can I get out of this? Now, you may just take the job to take the job. But while you're there, you certainly can get some tools. I would add, if you have a bad boss and you're leaving the mission to never burn a bridge, always leave on a good note mm -hmm. um, because you'd be surprised people know people. So <laughs> that's the other thing my wife said, never burn a bridge. I, mm -hmm. I always said never burn a bridge. I learned that at, at Pounker Foster PKF. When, they, when you left, if you were not in management, if you're not a, a, a manager above, they would take you to lunch and they would spend an afternoon with lunch. And it was a lunch and it was big money lunch. 
And the reason they did that was you're going into the industry. You're going to be a reverse manager, controller. You're going to move up. If you're treated nice on the way out, you may remember that. As a manager, I got a really sweet, nice briefcase. And you would go around and it was always the same briefcase. So you always knew people from PKF from in the industry because they always had it. I still think I have it upstairs in the end. Okay. The way they treat, they'll treat you good coming in, the way they treat you going out. So that my, my friend that I, I, I was playing golf with, I told him that. And one of our boss left and we threw him a party. He had been in five or six different companies, never had a going away party. And we were at a brewery, we lasted until you know, late. Um, he called the guy the next day, and we gave him some kind of present or something. We all chipped in. And um, he said, I've never been treated that way on the way out before, especially from this team, because I'll always remember that. Well, about four years later, he got hired by Francisco Partners to run a company, and he hired my friend. They, uh, the company ended up being sold for 240 million. And my friend got a big piece of it, got a big piece, piece of it. Not sure how much. And why? Because he treated him good on the way out the door. Now, did my friend give me anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> what would you recommend to the students that they do as as a kind of standard operating procedure after they've interviewed with somebody. We know going into an interview, we should research the heck out of the people. Make, make sure you thank them. Yep. Make sure you send a personal note, handwritten, and then an email. Now, the reason I say do that is everybody sends emails. You, you, know, you want to be different. You write a hand note. Not too many people know. So there was a, a gentleman that was a mentor of mine. He was in sales. He was an amazing, amazing salesman, right? Twice a year, he would go through his Rolodex, his contacts. He would take half of his contacts and write a chatty letter. Hey, Bill, so, da, 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 da. how are your kids? Uh, we haven't seen them in a while. Uh, my kids are fine. And they did this, this, this. Business going good, but we're doing that. Instead, we've got some exciting things. Hey, hope to see you in the next six months. And he wrote, and he would hand sign a letter. He would have the letters, you know, he can, at the time, pre-print them and have them collated and everything, and he'd hand sign them, send them out. So he had 3,000 contacts. So 1,500 one time, 1,500. But at least one time during the year, you heard from him, right? He lost his job. By the end of the day, he had seven offers. <laughs> Seven offers. He was an amazing marketer. Again, I'm an accountant by trade, but I'm marketing myself. You have to market yourself. Same thing. Just your contacts warm. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> just reach out when you need some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't reach out. Um, I used to, I used to, to, to kind of develop trust in things, but I would end up doing. Is that if I found an article or something, was, I would either print it out and send it to him, or I'd send an email and say, hey, thinking of you who thought this might be good. As a CFO, I would get 300 emails a day. I would get 100 calls a day. I didn't respond to them. I didn't have the time. As a CFO, I was working 12 hours a day, six days a week. We were in financial difficulty, but not because of me. Um, so I had my administrative assistant be the gatekeeper. They will always be a gatekeeper at a senior leader. You got to figure out how to get around them or through them. Best way through them, kindness. Face to face. Wait. So email, no. Handwritten, they're going to open it. End of the end of the week, my, my admin. By the end of the day, she would give me a red folder, a yellow folder, and a green folder. Green folder, red folder was 
you had to have action by the end of the day. Don't leave. Yellow folder, had to have action by the end of the week. Green folder, take it home on the weekend. And this is what I think you might be interested in. And then they had the black folder. It sat in the corner. It was round. <laughs> and she would dump all the stuff that I didn't need to dump. Who has, so for, I'm sorry. sorry. Who has a one o'clock class? Just you. Yeah, you? We're on the o'clock. And I do. Okay. They're yours. I'm going to turn this off. Okay. Uh, but that Thank was, you. This was wonderful. Well, I hope you all got something out of it. Can we take a quick picture just to 